Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of ElevateNonprofit.com, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swaim. Well, welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. Today, I'm excited to take a deep dive, a little intensive, a little a sort of wild side. <laughs> <laughs> or best practice experience yeah, that too. That too. about how to tell our own stories. And I think it's hard sometimes when we speak to organizations about the event is an opportunity to center your own story. Yep. And when you're in the work every day, it's yep. hard to figure out how best to do that. So I am so glad to sit here with the expert in storytelling, Kristen <laughs> Steele, mm. to talk a little bit about our organizational stories and how we best yeah. tell them. So if you don't know about Kristen, do you mind if I introduce you? <laughs> this is always painful. I know. I will just sit. Co-host in the hot seat. And hang. Well, let's just give a little bit of background because I think when we talk about storytelling, it's important for people to understand that you are a storyteller. Yeah. You have an MFA in creative writing. You are a playwright. You're a fiction writer. But mostly 90% of your writing time and, and energy goes to organizational storytelling and thinking about our nonprofit partners out there that we work with and how they're going to leverage their event as an overall story arc, right. but also what are the stories within the the story arc that they're sharing and how best to share their story. Yep. You've been on the show once before to dive into the event arc. Right. And in that event arc, if you haven't listened to that, go back to our previous episode about the event arc to understand that there is sort of a beat by beat recommendation about an event program. And one of those beats we call chapter two (laughs) is an organizational story about who we are and what we do. Now, when we had Sally Bixby on the show, she was saying, so many of us think that people just know what we do. Yeah. I have that personal experience of going to an event where I know the name of the organization. They're in our community. They've been around for a while. Right. I've been to their event three years running. I still have no idea what they do. None. And I leave there without really giving much. And I leave there without knowing how to get involved because I don't totally understand what it is they do. So I wanted to have you here to talk a little bit about what that chapter two moment is, about how we both show our work and tell our work Mm -hmm. and how best to tell our own stories. Let's do it. Okay. So let's start first with the most complicated. Sure. I think we can like scale out and then scale down. Sure. The most complicated organizations, I think, are often organizations where they're addressing a systemic issue. Yep. So hunger, poverty, um, education, and they might have 50 different ways they approach it. And our sort of development friends will frequently approach from a list of programs. Yeah. Our websites from a list of programs. Even our social media sometimes highlights each of those programs. Yep. But rarely is a list the way to move an audience. Correct. So how how do you approach complicated stories and avoid lists as a way to help people understand who we are and what we do? So I think the thing to remember is that for folks in organizations, they are embedded in a lane of work in that organization that they are passionate about that is really critical to them as making an impact on their mission. The story of that work Mm -hmm. is not the name of the program, the sort of metrics of success. Like I think there are a lot of weeds that are critical to gauge our success in our work but they are not what is going to break your donor's heart wide open for right. you. And so I, I say that because I don't want to say to folks that all of your programs and the names of them and what specifically they do aren't important. That's not what I'm saying. Right. They are they are critical. When you are trying to tell the story of your organization and in an impactful, efficient way, Jargon is the surest off-ramp mm, to yeah. that as a destination. And I think 
I want to honor for our development departments that often there is a divide between program staff and development staff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, often well earned. Mm-hmm. You know, I will hold that too. But I think sometimes there is a protectiveness mm-hmm. of programs and program people about their programs, and that development departments and comms departments don't tell that story well. And there might be a kernel in that. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we start with the idea that your mission is enough Mm -hmm. and lead from there when you're talking about your organization and your work, um, that level sets in that in the nonprofit sector, every organization out there has a mission. It's on paper. Whether you believe it or not anymore, whether you execute on it or not anymore, whether the wordsmithing of that is perfect, there is theoretically a uniting principle to your work. That's what we want to convey to people. And so when you talk about, you brought up systemic inequities, often that being really fraught and complicated to talk about. If we boilerplate those down, if we boilerplate hunger is a systemic issue down and food access and food equity down to an action, Mm -hmm. we move food from where it's not needed to where it's needed. Start simple and build up. I think sometimes it gets really hard to start with all of the scaffolding of all of our people and all of our programs and all of our impact. It's like, Let's reverse engineer that and start with the heartbeat. What governs what you do and what I do in this organization? What unites us? If you want to get really, really meta about it, if you're coming to the table as a storyteller, what do I believe Mm. about this work? What am I passionate about in this work? Well, you just tapped into something that I think is an important starting place, which is the why. Yes. You know, I believe is sort of a why statement. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Simon Sinek and the golden circle of why and kind of that as like a heartbeat for an organization? So Simon Sinek, TED Talk, golden circle of why, it's the best 10 minutes you'll spend. (laughs) If you want to spend more time, he has books, lectures, et cetera, that go on from there. But, um, and and sometimes it's helpful to have an example. Simon uses the example of of Apple, Uh Macintosh, the computer company. Yeah. So you have a lot, at the time when Apple broke through, um, you had a lot of other technology companies that were telling you, we've got 4.2 megabyte G3 processors. Intel, please, don't, processor. yeah, please don't give me <laughs> feedback on my lack of technological prowess. <laughs> but you get the idea. It was, it was you were telling me the, technology. the mechanics of it. Yeah. But you weren't telling me what it could do for me. And Mac cut through and sold us a vision of what life alongside technology, with technology, could mm. be. Ease, joy, fun, all of those things. They started with a why. And their yeah. why was, we believe technology should make your life better. Yeah. The way we do it is we have these computers, et cetera. And the way the computers do it is they've got these chips and these processors. I mean, you can get as granular as you want, but they didn't lead with that. Right. They led with selling me an idea of impact Mm. on my life and then how I could go and impact the world. They led with why. We believe technology should make your life better. And when they did that, if you cut open the top of my brain, (laughs) in leading with why, in leading with that sentence, I believe, we believe, you go straight to the decision-making center of my brain. Interestingly enough, that is also the part of my brain that is beyond language. Mm, Yeah. So language isn't getting in the way of me having an emotional resonance and making a decision. This becomes key when we're raising money, right? How do we cut through all of the chatter for people, get them to connect and move? And so the golden circle of why is exactly that. Instead of coming from the outside in, talking about the what and the how, and then maybe if we get there, the why, let's reverse engineer that and let's start with the why. Let's start with we believe. And so anytime we're working with clients who are like, we're unique, (laughs) we have a very complicated program strategy to attack this 
ill that right. we're trying to fix. With a new strategic plan. With a new strategic strategic plans. I love y'all. No one but cares. But strategic yeah. plans are in the way of you telling your story yeah. often. Strategic plans are how you demonstrate impact. And most specifically, they're really great, great when you have to report on grants. Yeah, annual reports. Annual yeah. reports, all of those things. But strategic plans are a way for you to all be on the same page as Correct. organization. As a donor, I want you to have one. Yes. I don't want to read it. <laughs> You're correct. So I just, I, it's not that I'm saying those things aren't important, but right. when we're talking about connecting to people quickly, efficiently, and emotionally, data's in the way. Right. All the names of your programs are in the way. Yeah. It doesn't really matter to me as a donor if you have five programs for food delivery or seven. Right. It actually doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you are working in food deserts with marginalized communities, moving food surplus to places where there isn't food, right? Those are the specifics, but I'm listening to those specifics even because you and I have connected on the why. Yeah. Because I believe and you believe that no one should be hungry. Mm. All of a sudden, I'm listening. Yeah, we have a shared belief. A shared in. belief system. We're traveling in that same halo of work. Now take me on a journey to talk yeah. to me about how you do that or what you do that with. So I think for a lot of people in the nonprofit sector, that feels wooey. Right. I also think they feel like it's wasted time. Mm. Because so much of their work is metrics reporting, strategic planning, all of those pieces that are the march we go through to show value, right? Yeah. To show impact. I want to say you will be able to show more value and more impact to donors when we are united in core belief. Mm. And it takes a quick minute to get us united in core belief. Just because I'm at your event doesn't mean we're united in core right. belief. Yeah, that's important. And so there has to be a place in your program where we take the time to level set. Yeah. And to get people to lean in. Because you can take them a lot of places if they trust that we believe the same thing. Yeah. And you're the person that's going to tell me how you do it to see if I if I can support that to do that. Yeah. So I think um, it feels a little counterintuitive sometimes. And it feels a little risky sometimes mm. for organizations to be like, you want us to leave with a belief statement? And what is interesting to me about that is we are a whole sector founded on belief statements. Yeah. yeah. There is not a nonprofit out there that does not have a mission statement. Yeah. And if you can't, I, I do not actually want to hear your mission stated re, mission no. statement repeated to me word for word. That's not interesting to me because that doesn't show me that it has resonance yeah. for you as an organization. But what's the heartbeat of your mission? statement. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, I think we often find that getting to the why is hard, yeah. you know, especially when organizations haven't been thinking that way or talking that way. Right. They speak to, you know, we have 17 different service <laughs> offerings for youth. Or we're a, a 501c3, 501c3 nonprofit. nonprofit. <laughs> I don't ever want to hear that again. Well, it it's speaks, a tax status. It speaks and to the what. Yeah. You know, it's it's about this is what we are. This is what we do. This right. is how we do it. But it rarely speaks to the why. And people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Yep. And so the idea of telling your story in a succinct fashion has to start from that why. Because yeah. if you don't have an easy way to, of conveying your why, you're immediately losing people out of the jump. Yep. And I think, too, there's, there is an undercurrent for folks that they are at our major donor event. They know who we are right. and what we do. And um, you were speaking about this earlier. Yeah. I, it isn't true. Yeah, There is natural acquisition that comes with every kind of major donor event. Yeah, Even absolutely. legacy events. People bring a plus one. Yeah, I mean, people I just bring kinda... a table. And those people are your prime targets. Yeah. And so... I think when folks are just like, ugh, we tell this story every year, people know what we do, let's scrap it. Right. You're missing the opportunity, one, to remind people what you do, Yeah. who are like, wait a minute, where am I? What's happening? Or to be different to those people, organizations continue to evolve, and to talk to the people who are fresh. Yeah. And when you level set everyone, that's how you close distance between the people in the room. Yeah. They all feel like, oh, we're all on this train together. Mm. We have common information now and we're moving forward versus 
the experience you and I have had attending some events where we were invited by somebody who's very embedded in the organization. Right. We come from the program stage. They don't tell me what they do. And the whole program, the person's like looking at or over at us like, isn't this great? Isn't this great? Uh-huh. And we're like, I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. I have yeah. no idea what this organization is. I can get on my phone and Google it, but that's not what you want. Right. I actually, it's funny. I, um, had an experience where we were at an event that had a whole bunch of entertainment and they were engaging the entertainment for the theme, but I didn't realize that. I thought the entertainment was part of their programming. (laughs) And I was like, these students are amazing. And then I found out they were not related at all. It was just the circus theme. It was a circus theme event. Mm -hmm. And I thought that these were their students, their performers coming to showcase the work that they do. And in fact, they're in like they're an after school program that does work with youth, but these were not their youth and they don't do circus arts. (laughs) And so, well, and I think what that speaks to, and I think this is a statement that could be really overwhelming for some of our nonprofit friends, everything happening at your event can have the potential of telling a part of the story of your mission. Yeah. Yeah. It can have the potential to be connected to your mission. Yes. And those are the most impactful, powerful programs. Yeah. Is when you are using a diversity of storytelling mechanisms to all tie back to your mission versus non sequiturs because you feel like you just need entertainment because people don't want to hear your story for that long. Right. And that's where I go back to the core mission, the core statement of your mission's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think starting with a why gives you sort of a nugget to begin with. But once we understand what our why is, which can be hard to do, I always recommend that people try to answer the question, we believe, Mm -hmm. so that if they can fill in the rest of that sentence, they're getting to a why statement. But once they have that why statement, how do you then best represent that why statement in your event? Like what is... What are the elements necessary to really help people understand your work? Sure. So for us, chapter two is the organizational story. Mm -hmm. And we really like to do that in two parts. Okay. A show and a tell. Mm -hmm. And great way to do that is to have a video, a a, a variety of messengers, right? Like if you think about just a solid person talking at me on stage to convey all of that, you're not gonna be as engaging as if you use the full array of paints in your box. So we like to do it through video and a speaker. So, Mm -hmm. and we call it an organizational video and a organizational speaker. That speaker often is your CEO executive director. We can talk about whether that's the correct person to have on Uh stage in that moment or not. Um, But it gives you the chance to show your breadth and your vision of leadership forward. Yeah. So your organizational video then becomes how you show the work of all of those programs in a really dynamic way. So instead of reading me, we have the Apple Blossom program that does this, this, and right. this. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing your work in action. I'm being taken into spaces at your organization. I'm seeing the folks that you work with, the folks that you do work for, and in part, the partners you're doing it with. You can use that opportunity in three to five minutes to show me such a broader range of your impact and your work than hearing each program, right. what it does, who it impacts. Show me. Mm-hmm. Take me there. Create an immersive experience for me to get into the heart of your mission and to show it in work. Right, right. And we couple that then with an organizational speaker. So we bring it into the room. And you, if you're having a in-person or hybrid event, that person is on stage with your in-person audience talking to them about the work, not a repeat of what we just right, saw, right. but perhaps an update of specific things that the donors in the room helped make happen by gathering last year, Mm -hmm. but also that vision forward. What I'm participating in by donating tonight is these things moving forward. And so it becomes that really sort of calibrated and balanced approach where you're not covering the same ground, but you're able to say, see, now you, you kind of get that in action, 
great. And here's how we're all going to move forward together and what that can look like. So an organizational video and speaker together, Yep. they don't always have to be in that order. Nope. And I want to dive into that a little, but two elements to both show and speak to your work from a perspective of why, starting with why, always from why. Yep. Okay. I want to dive into each of those elements Great. and how to create them. Great. So let's take a short pause. And when we come back, I want to ask first about the show. And then I want to ask you about the tell. Great. Great. At Elevate, we believe in bringing people together. Our online learning platform for fundraising events has webinars, workshops, downloadable tools, and more designed to save you time and stress when planning your next event. We're getting nonprofit, development, and event planning professionals the tools and ideas they need to create events that inspire donors and raise more money. So join us at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. All right, welcome back to the Fundraising Elevator. We're talking about organizational storytelling, and sometimes it can be challenging for folks. So we want to break down and digest We've already talked a little bit about having both the opportunity to show your mission and to tell folks about Mm -hmm. your mission. We've talked about the importance of starting with why, but let's dissect each of these elements. So the show, Mm -hmm. we often utilize video. I think video is something that can like have a life outside your event. It can be on your social media. It's a really quick way for people to see your work. And video, I think, has this really like compelling component in that you get to see emotion, you get to hear music, you get, you know, the full like color spectrum of your work. You get to like see the little kid running on the playground while also hearing from the teacher about the impact of their work. So there's so much you can do in a very short time frame with a video. But I want to ask a little bit about how do you start or what's your approach when in organizations like we need a video <laughs> and we're trying to dissect and figure out what is the storytelling we're going to we're going to start with yeah um i want to start first with adding the opportunity in your video i've heard now from several clients in the last couple months that grant yes granting organizations are <gasps> yes. actually asking you to submit a video about your work versus the didactic mm-hmm. our program does, our program does. So I, I think that adds a layer of encouragement, yes. question mark, probably feels like pressure, but uh, <laughs> an encouragement for folks to think about using this medium to more dynamically tell their stories. Yeah. So when we start with organizations, um, sometimes if we've kind of worked with them several years at their event, it could be that each year of the event, we focus on a different Component. aspects aspect or component of yeah. their of their programming so it could be um let's say uh there's a, an organization that has both a shelter piece mm. but then also has like a transitional housing piece um it could be that we sort of we believe big overarching statement one of the ways that shows up for us is, and we kind of do a slightly deeper dive on maybe the residential piece. Sure. And then the next year, um, you know, the program staff that weren't included in that video are like, hey, how do I get my program? You know, so you can do it that way. You can actually create for your whole event program. We do all of these things this year. This is our focal point. Yeah. And it's not that you're restricting funding to that, but it's that you're really sort of going deep and not quite as wide with your storytelling to show the impact in one particular yeah. area of your work that may be more timely or a bigger need mm-hmm. um, or something you haven't ever told about, told yeah. your your donors about. And you're like, wait a minute, we really have to sing this. You yeah. know? So I think that's one way is to sort of take a look at what's, what's the story of your organization that's really important to tell right now. And I often ask folks, what are you talking to donors about right now? 
Mm, yeah. What a great question. What great, what, what of your work are you talking to donors about? Cause that can help us narrow the field a little bit yeah. into think, and we, you know, folks have legacy programs that were like, yeah, we kind of do that, but it's not the core of what we do now because yeah. organizations continue to evolve. So don't spend a lot of time and energy on those pieces. Let's focus on where your attention work focused energy is. And so I think getting people to even name what it is that they want people to understand is is part of that. And then often we take a look at, is it helpful for you to have sort of a more specific, I don't want to say factually based because that starts making folks think they should bring in all these data points, but sort of a more factually concretely based video or something that's more aspirational Mm. about your work. Specific examples of that could be, let's tell the story of your four core programs, but instead of somebody just, I want to create some interview questions for program staff Mm. to talk about it. So you're stitching together different voices within your organization. That allows you to show your depth and breadth of experience on staff. It allows you to center voices that might not match the white leadership at your organization, for example. It it brings to light a lot of different opportunities for you when you're looking at how to tell your story. So um, that becomes one way. You can also narrate it. You can write a very specific narration if you're sure we've got to hit these points. This is how we talk about these things. This is what these are. And then the videotaping process becomes, how do we get beautiful, compelling, we call it B-roll, which is the the non-interview imagery that really shows your work in action. And you can have that narration running underneath that beautiful imagery of video and photos with music. Um, You can have, you know, title plates over that. It becomes a way that you can ensure the story you want to tell if you want sort of that tighter control on what that is. So there are a couple of different modes you can have sort of a more tactical approach to showing what, what you do. Yeah. We are this organization. We believe in food access. The ways we do this are blah, blah, blah. And, and the visuals are showing impact constantly. Yeah. Right. And so you're working on a different level with your donor instead of them just hearing it. So you mentioned a couple of different formats, and I just want to recap. So interview format, where you're bringing together experts that can speak either to the holistic why of the organization or also specific programs within the organization. Yep. You talked about narrated format, which there's a struggle with narration in that you have to know from the jump what exactly what you want to say. It's not, you're not discovering it in the interview process. It sometimes limits you. I do want to say like while you, while you get control over the narrative frame, uh, you also lose the ability to discover. And I can tell you in that interview process, we've actually had a video where we had the narration set. We actually had it in the can and we went and did some of the interviews. So we were going to break up the narration with some power statements from staff who used to actually be clients. And in doing that, unscripted, unprompted, that staff did more for the footage than the narration did. And so we talked talked to the organization and said, hey, this, we can move this forward in another way. Yeah. But they say, and I think it's more powerful to hear from those voices, and they totally agreed. So we scrapped the narration and got what we wanted from the interviews. I'm not saying that you want to extend expend all that energy, but it, the narration can lock you in. Right. If you're, if you're wanting to explore, you can explore. And then if you don't get what you need, you could also narrate. But I think sometimes there, there are some components there that are limiting. Well, and then there's another element that can sometimes go along with narration, which is um, an animation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I hesitate with animation because sometimes it is literally, graphics that you're animating, but other Mm -hmm. times it's just representation that you're animating. We just did a project with one of our filmmakers where we wanted to show statewide impact. And so they did a very long shot of a map and then stopped and and did stop stop motion animation where they stopped and started the camera a million times and kept adding more red dots with pins. So it had that tactical 3D look of pins on a map but they were cutting their camera to put 
the pin in, so mm-hmm. you never saw the hand. Mm-hmm. So the pins just popped up. Um, but it took for us kind of a scientific concept yeah. and broke it down into something that people could see a physical representation yeah. of. We did this also with an organization that does environmental protection work, and they wanted to talk about the fact that they're repopulating species and that when we limit species, we limit what's possible within the the whole ecosystem around it. And when we repopulate and have the full diversity, it creates like this exponential impact. Yeah. And so they used very different like color coded ping pong balls floating in the water to represent the different impact that different species being introduced had. So that kind of like animation, it could be graphics drawn. It could be that it's computer animation. It could be as simple as like a 3d representation can be another way to show. It's a shortcut. And I, when I say that, I do not mean that it's a shortcut for the filmmaker. No, because it's our lazy brains. We have lazy brains. We do have lazy brains. We are, uh, you know, we call them explainer videos, sort of that yeah. category that you're talking about. That's how we get fed information a lot now. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about what you're viewing on your phone, many of us have our phones on silent, so captions are turned on, you're reading things and watching. Like, that's how people are consuming yeah. sort of media. It's how we shop on Amazon now, even. Exactly. There's videos to promote the product. Exactly. So what you're doing, the net effect of that is a shortcut to yeah. your donor to just be able, like, instead of you standing up there and telling me we work statewide in Oregon and over 150 cities across the state, like really quickly, Red that, pins. but that image imprints yeah. on me in a different way. And when I think of your scope, I am always going to have that moment when all those red dots popped up on that map of Oregon. And so you're giving your donors different way to retain information about you in that way. Um, Same as images. I think when you're showing, like, you know, the narration could be about strengthening bonds among families. To say that neutrally from a stage, I'm like, you know, I bring my baggage of my family and you bring (laughs) your baggage and all these things. But when you're saying that over the top of this beautiful footage, of an adult hand reaching back and and capturing this little hand and walking. Like there's something about those that I'll connect to and retain when I think about the impact of your work. And I don't have to be able to explain it, but I go, oh, that's great. Yeah. Families together. This is, this is touching on why you need a partner that is a storytelling video producer. Yes, please. Because they're experts in visual story narrative. They're experts in helping to assess what is the asset we need to capture to tell the story. Um, You know, we produce the podcast here at the AV department studio, and they have a whole film production team that we partner with often. And one of my favorite organizational videos they did recently was um, speaking about the importance of the caretaking this organization does. And all of the B-roll footage that they shot showed the caretaking. It showed the meal being prepared. It showed the, you know, gifts being delivered. It was like demonstrating and putting a visual to the story narrative. You allow your mission to be experiential for people in the room when you use video to do that part of your storytelling. And I think people, people look at a budget. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But also, if somebody's pitching you 20 grand for a video, please email me directly and we'll figure that out. That is not what you should be paying for a video. You can get amazing, compelling videos for five grand, 7,500. We all have 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 phones that we're doing them. We utilize a lot of still photos and cell phone shot footage. Like, it does not have to cost a ton of money, but you're allowing people an experience of your mission. And that I guarantee you is what's going to resonate with them. And so you're missing an opportunity. If you're like, we don't need to spend that money. We can just tell them about it. I get that. I totally get that. And there's a time and place for that, but there's an opportunity. If you're paying that much for catering and a room rental and people are getting dressed up and showed up, you're also allowing a different cadence to your program and interspersing different modes. Our brains are lazy. They are lazy and they've gotten (laughs) lazier that if you're interspersing different modes of communication from the stage, all of it gets stickier. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it, there is this natural thing that happens. I love it because you have a room full of people that are starting to get social and they're chit-chatting and they're yeah. talking to their neighbors and all of a sudden the screen starts and everyone's like, oh, we the still, screen's on. Yeah. We still sit and, you know, often people are like, well, I can't show videos over the top of dinner. 
It's yes, like, you can. We have Netflix and chilled for uh-huh. how many years since 2020? Like, <laughs> we we're good. We and watch. Yeah. We're good. We can do that. And I actually think the video as a form of delivery is how you can create momentum in that way because yeah. it becomes that be quiet moment that you don't have to have somebody up on stage ding dinging, yeah. right? Like you can bring everybody into an experience together in the same moment. So talk to me about how long this should be. I'm hearing like documentary. Three to five, three to five, three to five, three Hours? to five minutes. <gasps> three to five I know, minutes. I know. It's, it, that seems so hard to do, but you can do incredible storytelling in three to five minutes. If you aren't, if you don't feel like that is long enough to tell your story, and I mean this with every ounce of care, love, respect, and empathy I have. You need to take a look at the story you're telling. Yeah. True. Editing is where the work gets done. Yeah. So if you need to start big and be like, this is everything we need to cover, and then scale back, look for duplication. If we talk about this program and this program, while each program may not get mentioned, they have a shared impact in this area of work. Yeah. Let's talk about that share. Let's talk about that area of work. You know, I think there are responsibilities within organizations of voices that need to be featured and sure. people who feel like they should be featured. Yep. And that that is internal politics that you will have to settle regardless of whether it's in a video yeah. or who's on stage. But I do think if you can't do it in three to five minutes, you've lost me. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. Um, and so it's about making it compelling and compelling is brevity. Yeah. Agree. So we pair this often. Yes. We do all this beautiful storytelling in a really tight three to five minute package and then pair it with a speaker. And there's a couple of reasons why we do that, mm-hmm. right? We're looking to create sort of a narrative that builds on each other. We're yep. looking to create a face of the organization, yep. like a real person that is there hosting everyone in the room yep. that is the representation for the organization. Yep. We're also looking to, <laughs> excuse me, establish a leader, like a vision forward. Mm-hmm. So when you are working with the speaker, mm-hmm. how do you help an organization identify who that person sure. should be? Sure. So there's a couple of things here for me when I'm evaluating it. I'm not sure if the organization is always <laughs> evaluating it, but when I'm evaluating that moment, um, I'm thinking as a donor. Mm, yeah. And for me to Donations can be weird. I'm giving you hard-earned money to go do work. Yeah. Trust is imperative for me as a donor. And so leadership and exemplifying those those sort of examples of leadership and stability in an organization and a vision forward, those all speak to me as a donor and yeah. are ways in which I evaluate how much I give. Mm-hmm. If you get an organizational speaker up there who is not inspiring confidence in me as a donor, who is not showing leadership, yeah. competent leadership of the organization, I'm going to be hesitant. Yeah. So thinking through that, I understand that smacks right up against sometimes obligation and, and ego. <laughs> obligation, ego, and we've always done it that way. Yeah. We've always done it that way is the killer of so many Good amazing, ideas. <laughs> amazing ideas. Yeah. So I think it's prudent and I think it's probably the best bet when you sit down to have that conversation, that that the first voice that you're evaluating on the table is your specific leadership, Mm -hmm. is your ED CEO. As an organization, you likely know how they are as a speaker. Mm -hmm. They're called Mm -hmm. to speak on your behalf often. Yeah. And so a lot of times we do have organizations who come to the table that are like, they are an amazing leader. They're maybe they've come up from program work. And the being the the face of the organization is not where their comfort level is. Right. Their comfort level is the work. That's where your video is so amazing <laughs> because you can bring their voice into the video, yes. asking them specific questions, getting specific answers, showcasing their best sides. Mm-hmm. But their best side might not be a four to six minute speech on stage. Yeah. So I think it's getting the ability to get real about what that is and if they are the best Speaker. vehicle, yeah, you know, for, for that message. They can help craft it. They can be a part of the conversations. Are they the right conduit? Yeah. Um, often they are. So often that makes sense. Um, 
often in organizations, depending on what their structure is, their board leadership is really dynamic and amazing. Yeah. And and especially in times of transition, they can be the consistent. You know, we've, we often have a lot of organizations that are going through leadership transitions. There are events still happening, but we're having sort of, you know, some leadership transitions. So thinking about who, do you have a deputy director? Mm-hmm. Do you have a second? Um, is that someone on your board that can be the voice of knowledge yeah. and um, confidence about your work. Like I'm looking for this voice to be confident about your work and where it's going and the impact that you're having. And so using those as frames, I think that helps you start to figure out who the right storyteller is. Let's talk about when it's the right storyteller, but they're still just not comfortable on stage. Yep. What are some of the ways that you've approached helping someone feel more comfortable on stage? Sure. Um, So I would throw out there, there are worlds in which that speaker on video Mm, in, you know, we have, we had a speaker a couple of years ago that we filmed in the context of their organization. So you were taken sort of, it had a context, right? I'm coming to you from. Day in the life sort of day in the life sort of thing. So it teed them up to have context instead of awkwardly perhaps being on stage. That's where their comfort is, right? They're in the midst of it. They're speaking about what they know. You're able to capture that and show them in their finest light. And I think that can be an option for folks. I also think coaching Mm. for them can be helpful. And often it's about getting them to tap into if, you know, Theoretically, this person on stage is also somebody who's in conversation with your big donors. Mm -hmm. And it's getting them to remember who they are and how they are in those conversations and that this is that, but it's happening literally on a bigger stage. Yeah. And I often find that leadership is not asked, why do you do this work? Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing an intake for somebody that I'm, I'm working on a speech with, sometimes I'm writing the speech and then they're editing it and crafting it to be more in their voice. Sometimes I'm just sort of giving them bullet points that then they either speak from or draft from. Mm -hmm. But regardless of format, I start with, I would love to know why do you do this work? Yeah. You can watch them shift out of we're a 501c3 mm-hmm. robot yeah. mode. Not that everybody's a robot, but you understand. There's like those rote things that you have yeah. to be able to do off the cuff and slip into, oh, there you are. Uh-huh. That passion that you're speaking to me right now, how do we write a speech that that's what you're showing donors yeah. in the room? That's what's important. Okay, you just said write a speech. <laughs> word for word, Let's y'all. Let's talk about yeah. that. I think, my personal opinion, mm-hmm. is that The worst read, most scripted speech is still better than the extemporaneous, no plan, get on stage and wing it. I think that the wing it never goes as planned. It's always too long. There's always a lot of insider conversation happening. Like, I want to thank Joe and I want to thank Sarah. And we're all like, who's Joe and Sarah? Mm -hmm. That it creates, I think, um, distance. Mm -hmm. And it also does the opposite of what the speaker was trying to accomplish by not having a script is it actually kind of makes it hard to understand and follow. Whereas even a script that is read word for word by someone who's terrified to be on stage is going to convey more of a message and more impact than an unscripted script. But you've done a lot of work with folks where you've helped them to craft a script and then practice it and then distill it to bullet points so they have reminders. Mm -hmm. You've also done something I think is interesting, which is throw them questions Mm -hmm. to prompt so that they can have someone else in the conversation Mm -hmm. with them. Mm When you're thinking about like prepping a speaker Mm -hmm. and a development director is trying to prep their executive Mm -hmm. director, so often I think we go, hopefully they have it, and we Mm -hmm. just hope. What are some of the things you would recommend that development director do to prep their executive director? Yeah, I think being confident in your, I'm speaking specifically to the development director now, Mm -hmm. being confident that how you feel about them as a speaker 
is how a lot of people feel about them as a speaker. Maybe even how they feel about themselves as a speaker. (laughs) Most likely how they feel about Uh themselves as a speaker. And it's okay to have a vulnerable discussion. I need development staff to understand that this speech, this moment, can make or break your program. Yeah. So I think that they've got five minutes. They can do whatever they want with it. I understand that that shakes out in some organizations that that's how it has to get done. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you from the jump that you will not raise the money you could if you had a really cohesive program that brought all of its strongest elements. So that said, I do think um, there are different ways it can happen. So we talked about video of somebody being Mm -hmm. in place and kind of giving speech to camera. We've also had speakers that we've pre-recorded in video or done live on stage in what we call a fireside chat. Yeah. Where the speaker, the 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 leader of the organization is really good when they are answering a question because it's specific, it's confined. They're able to tap into their passion mm-hmm. and speak, you know, like here's my 90 second answer to that question. And then they're given the next guidepost with another yeah. question. So we're able to control some of the speech by giving, okay, here's how we want to build the arc of the speech. So we're going to ask about this first, then this, then this. And then the speaker is able to respond to that in a way that allows them to be dynamic. So part of it is understanding what tools do they need to feel confident and dynamic and to, to do that work. If standing at a podium reading a speech or going off of bullet points, which I agree with you on that. Scripted is always better mm-hmm. if people are like, I don't know how to do this. Um, that that Q&A can kind of feel like, one, a break from format for your audience, which is kind of engaging. Mm-hmm. I don't know about anybody else, but I go to live theater to watch the train wreck, right? Like, <laughs> And so there's a lean in of like, what's going to happen? Yeah. Not that your ED speech is going to be a train wreck, but that unknown element, you've just turned it on its head and all of a sudden I'm like, well, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. It allows you to to bring in a partner, perhaps organization or a sponsor to allow them or another a, leader or another leader to show solidarity in in different uh, areas of work. It really can provide a different opportunity and allow your ED to sing. But I think barring all that, I think being able to have a conversation about what the opportunity is, what they want to make of it and where they feel like they need support Mm -hmm. before getting into, okay, what would you like to talk about? Like we have to know how people are coming into that, that situation. And, um, I feel like when you set it up to be vulnerable through the process, they will tell you that doesn't feel great. I'm feeling really confident here now. And I wasn't before it it allows it more even footing and allows it to be a back and forth because at the end of the day, I often find that no matter how they are as a leader or what confidence they project, when, if they were to be really honest in that moment, when they're looking at the speech and prepping it, hopefully they're prepping it before the event, they feel vulnerable. They feel nervous. And nervous can be really good. And nervous can be amazing and really great in a room. And they can have earnest reactions in front of an audience. And I think that is something I want folks to hear. Yeah. It's great for you to stand in front of a room of supporters and friends and people who are there and have a heartfelt reaction to that room. Yeah. You don't have to just get up there and drive it like a Mack truck. We get, that's the whole point of gathering. Yeah. If we are in a room together, we're living our life in front of each other. And that means reacting to each other. So when the room laughs, laugh with them. Yeah. Take it in. If you had a like power punch statement that didn't get applause, keep going. You know, like you also have to be able to calibrate in those moments. And I think people feeling like they can be vulnerable in the prep allows you to have those conversations with them and allows them to think like, okay, great. Yeah. So like practical application, as a development director trying to prepare their boss, the executive director to be on stage or the president to be on stage, there's a couple of things that I just want to recommend. One have a cover like carve out a meeting months before your event <laughs> that is like two months before your event at least to have a conversation about what message they're delivering mm-hmm. then write a speech either with them or for them and deliver it to them to make their own mm-hmm. they can edit it they can revise it they can update it then schedule another time now a month out from the mm-hmm. event to practice it because in 
the written word is different than the articulated verbal Correct. word. And in that process, sometimes we don't actually understand that what we wrote is harder to say than we think it is. Right. So having that time on the schedule where they're practicing their speech in a, in a place that feels comfortable to them, right? Like, let me come to you. We'll meet in your yep. office. It'll just be the two of us. But I want to like have you yep. articulate this so that we can make edits to it. Yep. Then delivering a final speech to them with at least a week or two of practice mm -hmm. time that they can get it in their bones and in their body. They could work with a spe speaker coach. But then the day of event, practice yep. it. Get on stage, hear your own voice, because it's different to hear your voice mm -hmm. echoed back at you. Hear your own voice, get recommendations from your staff about where you should be softer, where you should be faster, if you should cut that part practice it so that by the time you get up in front of the audience, the nerves that they're seeing, the excitement that they're seeing is about the connection to yes. the room, not about the fear of the material. Yeah, they're not white looking, knuckling through just right. their speech. But I think what's interesting too about that is that um, there, are, I, I, I know there's folks listening right now that are like, I can't get my speech from my ED. Yeah. They just show up with it and give it. Yeah. I, I want to honor and respect that. And I think one of the best things you can do is get into conversation with them about the rest of the program. Mm. Because what potential is there is that they can cannibalize the rest of what you've worked so hard. Let's say you've yeah. put an org video together or your special appeal story yeah. or award, you know, award speeches, they might take content that you have already really yeah. dynamically put together <laughs> and make it the whole content of their speech. Yeah. And then you just have this duplicative moment that doesn't set them up in a good way yeah. to look impactful. And it just takes the wind out of a lot of other sales. And so barring anything else, if your ED will not let you participate in the formation of their speech, I think what would be really helpful for those folks in those situations is to outline, hey, I've built the program with these elements in place, leaving this chunk for you. And what I want would love for you to cover in your speech is this, this, and this. Yeah. And they may take it, they may not. Right. But then you've done your work to make sure that it's not just the same thing getting said by somebody after somebody yeah. after somebody on stage. And that's the hazard of winging it, right? Yeah. That somebody just, and I think the biggest, the biggest message in that is, is the speech is not a standalone. And I think it often gets treat, treated as right. a standalone. Yeah. It's like, it's my speech. I'll just do it. Yeah. I'm fine. I don't need anything. But everything's always happening in context, and the best event programs are completely contextual and feeding off of one another and pulling narratives through and building on themes and all of those things that if somebody's treating it just as their own, this is my five minutes and I'm going to drop in and drop out, they're missing the opportunity to create a cohesive piece. Yeah, absolutely. So same question about speaker as video, how long should it be? Uh, three to five, yeah. six starts getting a little, like we're just, we're so wired for shorter. And yeah. when you have the same person at the podium saying things, it doesn't actually matter how compelling the speaker is. Well, I also there's, think- You only have an, such an such an attention. And yeah. I only think there's so much of the story you should be telling. I think if you're getting up and you're speaking for more than five minutes in, if the, in this format, it means that you haven't done the work to edit it. You've totally. written something with a whole bunch of ideas and then you haven't edited it. You haven't practiced it. You haven't That's rehearsed right. it to hear how it sounds. That's right. Because if you did, you would find, ooh, that re is repetitive. Ooh, I already said that. Oh, yep. I, you could say that a better way. Let's tighten up that yep. concept. The rehearsal yep. is so important. And I think that so often, like you said, the development director sits in the, the chair of having to produce a really amazing event and the executive director shows up at the last minute, mm -hmm. gets on stage and takes the mic. And that is a real potential to tank everything else that went into the event if it's not thoughtful, rehearsed yep. and intentional. Yep. And I'm I, the executive directors I'm working with their speeches on right now, we're doing bullets mm. for them in tandem with the org vid the organizational video treatment we've put together with them. So we're like, best case, 
organizational video is going to cover this ground and you're going to cover this ground. And then we're consistently sort of monitoring as the org video is getting developed by our production partners and coming into draft form. And then sometimes we're either editing the full speech with that in mind, like, yeah. cool, here's the ground that the organizational video covered. I don't need to do all that. Right, right. Or we're waiting. I have the bullet points of what my intention is so I can start noodling on it, but we're waiting until we get that draft yeah. of the org video to be. And, and often it changes. We flip-flop the order based on that. Well, I want to talk about yeah. that in a minute because that talks to me about sort of the rest of the structure of the program. Yep. So let's take a short break. Great. And when we come back, I want to dive into that question of what order, what comes next, and understanding kind of what else the different roles are in the event. So uh, we'll be right back. The Fundraising Elevator is recorded at the AV Department in Portland, Oregon. For years, they've been our trusted partner, delivering exceptional audiovisual production and videography for nonprofits. In 2020, they transformed into a dynamic live streaming studio, producing more than 900 virtual and hybrid events. Now, we embark on an exciting journey together to bring you this podcast. Seeking the best in live events, video production, and live streaming? We proudly recommend our friends at the AV Department. Link in the episode description. Welcome back to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. We've been diving in with Kristen Seal about the idea that in the program of our event, we have this segment that we've now learned is about 10 minutes at the most <laughs> <laughs> that is a combination of a show and tell with a speaker and a video. Mm -hmm. My question to you is what comes first? What order do sure. those go in? I think I often start thinking about my program while we're, this is where shapes, uh -huh. uh, we think of the whole program as an arc. Okay, so right? we're like on that, an arc, we're climbing story. the hill. Yes, we're climbing the hill toward the peak, which is your appeal, your fundraising moment. Okay. Second shape, when we're talking about order of things, I like to think of it as a funnel. So org video at top, sort of the widest part of the funnel, the mm -hmm. widest net of the story. Moving into the executive director, who's a little more narrowed, mm -hmm. right? Building towards your special appeal story, which is very specific story of impact. So sometimes that's the shape I start with, and then we make changes based on, on what happens. So um, often org video first, coming out of the org video to your executive director or leadership person on stage mm -hmm. with the tell, right? Show and tell, org video and, and speaker. But there are times when the, the flip of the org video and the speaker starts to make a lot more sense yeah. based on content. Um, I have somebody I'm working with right now that really wants the um, example in the org video to pull through and talk about mm. some of the specific points of her speech. And because we have that mapped out and we know what that is, that becomes a really easy frame. Reference point. Reference point. Yeah. But with, for other pe speakers, sometimes that like future forward enthusiasm, um, dynamic leadership piece is a really amazing pe way to bring people into the program and it seizes yeah. their attention. And they actually tee up their team, the work they're doing, and the org video, and do a really great transition to, let's see that work in action. Yes. And then we move into the org video. So I think you need to stay flexible mm -hmm. based on what ground you're trying to cover with each. And in the final sort of sprint into your event, how they actually play off each other. Yeah. It, it's not a, it's usually not a I don't know. It could go either way. Usually it's pretty specific. Like this makes sense to me or something feels weird here and you flip them and you're like, ah, oh, thank you. Yes. That yeah. makes more sense. Well, I think it's the climbing up the hill scenario, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you're trying to build momentum and energy and you're trying to like mm -hmm. increase engagement. Mm -hmm. And if you have this really beautiful, compelling video, 
it might actually be a beautiful build out of a speaker. Totally. But you might also have an organizational speaker that people would like walk off a cliff following because they're so compelling. Totally. And if they're that compelling, then let's put that video first and then have that lead to the speaker that's just like going to take it and take us there and take us to the church of your organization. You know, you want to keep building energy. And if your organizational speaker is a hiccup to energy. Mm. You want the things around them to buoy them. Yeah. So order them so that it's buoyed so you don't lose momentum, that you continue to gain it. Great. So then when our organizational speaker steps off the stage, yeah. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully at this point, you've welcomed guests, you've started your program and you've gotten them mm-hmm. focused. You've now shared your show and tell moment, chapter two, this is who we are. Chapter three, you're about to move into fundraising. Mm -hmm. What should that organizational speaker be doing at that point? Modeling what they want from everyone else to be doing, for everyone else to be doing in the room, focused on the program. Mm -hmm. I understand that people see people, see donors, feel like they're being rude if they don't cultivate them in the moment. But I would actually say that conveys a discard or a disregard for what's happening on the stage. Maybe yeah. you have a staff member on stage. Maybe you're showing a video. Like people pace off of you. So when yeah. you're moving around the room talking to people, people want that permission to just go do whatever. So you need to show the attention and to set the tone for that. People will pace off of that as yeah. well. I think uh, so often we sort of forget that that speaking moment just established them as the host. You're on stage off stage. Right. Period. But then when you sit down as the host, you're not paying any attention. Yep. You're doing other things. Yep. We had an organization we worked with years ago that had a surprise $10,000 gift happen at their event. And it was theater style seating. Everyone was in rows facing forward. And the executive director was sitting up front, had just given their speech. Now they're fundraising. Surprise $10,000 gift at the top of the fundraising from the back of the room. <laughs> the executive director leapt up, ran to the back of the room to thank that donor and hug them. Very genuine response. Sure. Very sweet of course, response. Of course. But guess what? None of their other fundraising. It was like you could count to three and the whole room stood and started moving around the room because that executive director set the tone. You know, they got up, they Mm -hmm. ran to the back of the room. The next donor who gave didn't get any recognition, didn't get seen by the executive director because he was too busy thanking the first donor. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, the rest of the room was like, oh, permission to go to the bar. And the fundraising just stopped. So they got one surprise gift and they got no other giving. So the importance of the executive director sitting, paying attention to the program, and then also like acknowledging donors around the room as it's happening, but staying so that you can see all of the giving that's Mm -hmm. happening and value every gift. Yeah. And then afterwards, go to your team at registration and say, Get, generate a report for yep. me of who gave and let me go work the room. And you go hug and thank and hug and thank and hug and thank and hug and thank. That absolutely you should be doing after the program, but not during the program, especially if your client is the next person getting on the stage. Yep. It's so disrespectful to that speaker yep. when you are like, I'm done and mm-hmm. you moving off the stage and moving out into the totally. party. All right, fundraising elevator. Yep. I'm going to ask you the same question we ask everyone that yep. is on the show. We're going to hop into the elevator to the penthouse and take a look at where the party is. Tell me about a memorable experience or a memorable event you went to. What made it memorable? Yeah. Um, in thinking about this, I mean, we do events for a living. Yeah. So I think that I wanted to think sort of outside of that box, but what I bring to that. Um, so, one of the first concerts I ever mm. went to, um, I was 17. I had to drive two and a half hours to get to San Francisco to go to the show. I'm going to date myself terribly. Um, we saw Pearl Jam before anybody knew who, who Pearl Jam was. And um, Rage Against the Machine opened for them. These are only important because of what happened in the crowd as a response to those bands. Um, I'm an introvert but I love music. Live music is one of my favorite things in life. And um, it was the first time and time I go back to often where I felt what happens in a group Mm. in terms of dynamics in a group, both as a big group and a small group. So I went with a group of friends. 
Um, I happen to be the only female identified person in that group. Mm-hmm. Um, and the crowd got very animated. Uh-huh. And eventually I realized my feet were no longer on the ground. I had kind of been shimmied up uh-huh. and I was shoulder to shoulder with people, but my feet were no longer on the ground. And the people I was with immediately saw that, knew that, and sort of grabbed, each grabbed a corner of me. <laughs> and we traveled as a bubble sort of in this bigger crowd. But there was nothing malicious about it. It was just the response to the program on stage and what was happening. And you could feel the swell up and you could feel the swell down and you could feel the interchange and exchange. And that has stuck with me about the potential of energy in a room and what it is to experiencing things together Yeah, as a core of gathering. And that visceral feeling of not having complete control over what was happening but also feeling held. Oh, um, yeah. And I think you can have smaller experiences inside of bigger experiences, and those two can play off of each other. Mm. Um, and so I go back to that a lot in terms of just really viscerally understanding that. And I think that's something for people to remember when they are planning their events. There are, you know, people go to events with people. Maybe they're hosting a table. There's right. what's going on in that ecosystem as well as what's happening in the whole, in the room. whole room. Yeah. And you're, you're interplaying with those. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think it's thinking about those when you're putting your program together and what that looks like. It's immersive. We it's talk immersive. about immersion yep. a lot because of Paul Zach's yep. neuroscience studies. And it creates an environment where something happened as a group. You had yeah. an experience as a group. Your heartbeats yes, connected. Yes, they all connected. Yeah. yeah. And that was, I think, people... If they think about times in their life where they have experienced that, yeah, that will put them in a place to start thinking about what that interplay can be. So let's head down to the basement yeah. and talk about tools. Yeah. What's a tool you recommend for a fundraising professional, but maybe even more specifically a storyteller? Um, thank you, Peter Drury. Uh-huh. The concept of story listening. Mm-hmm. Um, I think to be a good storyteller, you also have to be a good story listener. Yeah, um, And that's about space, but that's also about listening for the heartbeat behind the heartbeat. Yeah. There's the stories we tell and, but often the stories we don't tell are really important. And I don't, I don't think as story listeners, we necessarily need to be told that story that Mm. we don't tell, but if we know it's there and we make space for it, it makes the stories that are told um, better. Well, I think you're an incredible story listener, which is what makes being on this podcast with you so fun because you draw different elements and perspectives out in our guests. But I appreciate you being the storyteller today (laughs) and being in the hot seat. Um, There's so many different ways that folks can get a hold of you if they want help with their storytelling. How do folks best get a hold of you? Sure. So um, you can actually book time to talk to me, calendly.com backslash event storytelling. Um, Also, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can email me, Kristen at swamestrategies.com. We'll put it all in the show notes. But um, yeah, please reach out. There's nothing that makes me happier than for organizations to tell their stories more impactfully. I agree. There are some incredible examples of great stories out there that we'll make sure to have some links so that if you're trying to get some ideas about how to tell your organizational story, we'll throw a couple of links in the show notes of some good organizational videos just to give people some like ideas to stem off of. Thank you for being in the hot seat today. Thank you for joining me in the fundraising elevator. And I hope there's some good ideas for folks to be able to run off and think about how best to tell their story. Thanks. The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV Department. The program is produced by April Clark and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson and Heidi Christensen. Video production by Chris Peterson, Whitney Gomes, and Nathan Bouquet. Video editing by Steve Osborne. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group and support from Sophia Keller, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett. Loving the fundraising elevator, but wondering how you can talk to Sam and Kristen? Well, now's your chance to do it. Book one-on-one consulting time with Swain Strategies experts, Sam, Kristen, and Mary, and get all your event questions answered. 
our team has you covered on strategic planning, fundraising strategy, storytelling, data tools, and registration support. Get the tools and the help you need to make the most impact at your fundraising event. Book at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes.